Hi everyone, uh, today we're going to do a quick introduction to the Redshift equals zero massive galaxy survey. Uh, we're going to do a little data exercise with this and understand a bit about the evolution of galaxies from this local galaxy survey. Uh, Cause Redshift is Z, this will be the Z equals zero MGS or Z zero MGS. So uh, today I just wanna do a little bit of a demonstration for this. It'll set you up for a couple problems on your homework. Uh, what we want to do is use the Z0 MGS data set and uh, use that to plot the 2D and 3D distribution of nearby galaxies on the sky. Uh, from there, we'll move over and plot the color magnitude of diagrams in different units than we're used to. We'll make them into physical units and study the stellar mass of galaxies, which I'll indicate with an M star, and then the star formation rate, which has a little dot over it. So that's the M dot uh, star. And that uh, both of those are measured in units of solar masses and solar masses per year, respectively. Uh, we're going to show that there's a deep fundamental relationship between the stellar mass and the star formation, right? And then we'll illustrate a couple principles about uh, clusters of galaxies and how they manifest in terms of this uh, relationship. Uh, I wanted to start out by telling you about the Z0 MGS. Uh, it comes from two main data sources. Uh, the first one is the Galaxy Evolution Explorer, and the other one is the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. Uh, Galax is the first one, and then we'll call the second one WISE. Uh, these were two satellite missions that uh, ran in the first couple decades of this century, so 2000 up to 2020, uh, and they surveyed large chunks of the sky, and therefore they they had this great perspective on what the nearby galaxy uh, population looked like. The key to understanding why these two satellites are very useful for us uh, is illustrated in this plot of the spectral energy distribution of stars. Uh, so this plots the emergent light from a certain mass of stars. So this is solar luminosities per solar mass uh, per unit nanometer because it's a flux density. Uh, or a luminosity density, uh, and it's plotted as a function of the wavelength. So the optical on this plot is going to run around in uh, the few hundred nanometers, so it'll be over here on the left. And so in orange, what you see is the curve that represents a young star forming pop or a actively star forming population of stars, uh, just what you would see in the galaxy. And then the blue curve illustrates the same SED if there's dust in the galaxy, and then it reprocesses it. You'll notice that the population here is quite bright in the optical and the near ultraviolet, uh, and then once dust gets uh, integrated, it uh, absorbs some of that light in the ultraviolet and reprocesses it into the infrared. So, GALAX is a telescope that observed the near ultraviolet and the far ultraviolet. I've illustrated it here with these two blue bands labeled NUV and FUV respectively. And you'll see that those are probing the stellar continuum. Uh, these are seeing the bluest stars or the hottest stars. This is beyond blue. And so the far ultraviolet and the near ultraviolet uh, pick out that part of the spectrum that are really sensitive to young massive stars. In contrast, WISE is sampling the other end of the spectral energy distribution, and there were four bands on WISE, and we will use three of them in the data sets that we have here. So WISE 1, you'll notice, sort of sits there at about three to four microns, and what WISE 1 is showing you is the, uh, what WISE 1 is showing you is the stellar continuum. Ys3 and 4 are a little farther out, uh, and they're showing you the infrared that's been reprocessed by dust radiation. So what's key about this Ys1 band is that it detects stars and starlight while, av while avoiding the influence of dust. On the left-hand side of the plot, what you see is that the FUV and the NUV get really attenuated by the dust, but the WISE-1 doesn't show a lot of change. It still traces that stellar continuum, and therefore this is a great proxy for the total stellar mass in the galaxy. Additionally, it traces stars of all masses really well, and that's because both uh, low-mass red stars and high-mass blue stars 
are emitting in the WISE-1 band. So WISE-1 is a great tracer of, of the uh, integrated star formation population, and then WISE-3 and 4 are processing uh, light uh, that's been emitted in the uh, optical. And what we think about this is that the WISE-1 band is tracing the total amount of stars, and then the NUV, FUV, and WISE-3 and 4 bands are uh, tracing star formation. The NUV bands and the FUV bands are showing what we can see that's uh, not behind dust, and then the stuff that's behind dust will be absorbed and re-radiated, and that will show up in the infrared, so the WISE 3 and 4. So the combination of the NUV, FUV, and the WISE bands uh, give us this total perspective on both uh, exposed and embedded star formation. So by using that as a kind of observational preamble, we can return to an idea that we saw a little earlier, uh, which was this is the idea of a color magnitude diagram. And so this color magnitude diagram here was taken from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and we identified different populations of uh, galaxies here. We call the blue cloud that was blue and lower mass, a little actively star forming, and then the red sequence, um, uh, and it was up there and it was showing no signs of star formation but tended to be the most luminous. And what we'll do with the Z0 MGS data is we'll take this and we'll transform it from this kind of magnitude weirdo space into a space where we have real physical properties describing the uh, local galaxy population. And so we'll actually show you this in detail in glue, but if we make a nice plot of these results, we see a reversed uh, trend from what we saw earlier. So what we see on the horizontal axis is the total stellar mass of the galaxies. And so uh, the, that's shown uh, there, it's in a logarithmic scale. So we see sort of three orders of magnitude in stellar mass here. Now on the vertical axis is the star formation rate measured in uh, solar masses per uh, year. And what we can see is that uh, there is a well-defined sequence of galaxies locally uh, that goes along that line. And here, the star-forming main sequence, these are the blue cloud galaxies. But when we cast this into the um, observational space, they form a very nice sequence here that I've drawn kind of a sketch of a line through here. And then the uh, quenched and retired systems down there in the lower right-hand corner those are showing you where the elliptical galaxies are. These are the star. Uh, these are the red and dead systems, the uh, things that are not undergoing massive star, uh, significant star formation. You'll notice that the quench systems sit to slightly higher masses than the star forming main sequence on average, and that reflects what we saw here in the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey data, uh, where the red sequence sat up there at higher luminosity. But uh, we get this better defined sequence because we're actually operating in a physical space. And so all of the weirdnesses of looking at the G and the R band alone uh, from Sloan are kind of washed out. And we see a sort of more uh, significant sequence of uh, stars. Uh, that of star forming galaxies. So again, this is a major uh, piece of galaxy evolution. We want to try to understand what kind of systems and processes are happening here. And critically, what makes a system star forming versus what makes it quenched and retired. And so we'll do, uh, we'll kind of explain some of the punchlines to this over the next couple weeks in class. But I wanted to give an illustration of uh, the, uh, of, uh, the data that kind of define the local universe and galaxy. Galaxies. The other thing that we'll be looking at today is a cluster of galaxies. Uh, the galaxy. This is the Virgo galaxy cluster. Uh, this is a very deep image of this, and it's kind of an insanely, uh, insanely dense galactic cluster here. And what's neat about this is this contains both star forming sequence, uh, star forming main sequence uh, galaxies, as well as these quenched systems. So you can see the star forming main sequence systems are the ones that are a little bluer in this image, and 
then the kind of reddish yellow galaxies, those are the quench systems. And they're kind of mixed in all together here. But what's kind of interesting about this is that just by eye, you can see that some of these quench systems tend to sit towards the center of the cluster. And then there's more of the blue lower mass galaxies spread out around the edge. It's not exclusive. Um, uh, the distributed this way, but it's pretty, um, it's pretty notable that those red galaxies are all kind of there in the center of the galaxy, of the cluster. And we'll learn that that's physically meaningful, and we think that the interactions between galaxies are one of the factors that leads to quenching. So, without further ado, let's get into looking at glue. So here, is our standard glue window. And I'm going to uh, drag the z0mgs.fits uh, file into the uh, glue window. And that's going to bring up the um, data set up here in the usual uh, values. And the first thing I want to do is see what these data look like on the sky. So I'm gonna drag this in here as a two-dimensional scatter plot. And then I'm going to look at the values here. The first things uh, here are a PGC number. PGC is just a galaxy catalog, and so every galaxy in here has a PGC number. We don't care about that. We want this on the sky. And so I'm going to select the RA value up here at the top, and then the DEC value uh, there uh, right below it. And that plots the stars in right ascension and declination space. I'll make that a little bit bigger here. Uh, so this is the celestial equator and the poles. And what you'll notice is that there's this U-shaped signature right here. That is the galactic plane. And one of the reasons why you see this cut through the galactic plane is it's very hard to see galaxies through our own galaxy. The dust gets in the way here. I can make that a little more uh, noticeable if I plot this as galactic longitude versus galactic latitude here. And you'll notice that that zone of exclusion sits here right along the middle. And so we just can't see the galaxies through there. That's an observational effect. The other thing that we can kind of notice is that there's all of this kind of structure and loops here. And indeed, there's a lot of galaxies grouped up over here. This is that Virgo cluster that we're going to go look at in a little bit more detail later uh, up here in uh, this sort of kind of quadrant right there. But there are these kind of wisps and filaments, and there's parts of this that are kind of empty. And this isn't because there's the galactic plane there. Uh, these are actual voids in our galaxy pop. Population. So let's go on back and turn this into a right ascension and declination plot. And I'm going to do something that you know, won't be required for you, but I think is kind of neat. Um, we can create some arithmetic attributes. And uh, we're going to create an XYZ plot so we can get a three-dimensional view of the local galaxies. So I'm going to bring up X and I'm going to use uh, the uh, effect that's called the distance um, megaparsecs. So dist MPC. Uh, sorry, I cut off the screen cap uh, when I was showing you that. So let's uh, bring that on up here and let's close that one. Uh, distance MPC. And we're going to do it times np dot cosine of the right ascension times np dot pi over 180 to turn it into radians. And we're going to do np dot cos of the deck. So this is just doing the spherical polar uh, deprojection like we've been doing in a lot of our other uh, three dimensional studies. np dot pi over 180 back into radians. And yeah, there we go. There's an x. I'm actually going to uh, highlight that edit it, copy it, because all I'm going to do for a Y here is paste it in and change that first cosine to a sine. And then I'm going to add in a Z, not the redshift Z, but um, the Cartesian coordinate Z. And I'm going to change the deck coordinate here to a sine. And so if I do that, I have an XYZ set of uh, attributes. And I'll plot those there. And I think, my friends, it is time for a three-dimensional plot. So let's bring this on in here. 
as a 3D scatter. Sorry, Windows users, that this isn't as reliable as it should be. We are definitely not going to worry about it. Oh, I don't know what's going on here, but boy, it's uh, it's weird. Um, but we want to go here and select, again, screen cap doesn't get it, but I'm going to get those X, Y, and Z values. They'll be down at the bottom. And what you see here is that the volume that is uh, set up by the Z0 MGS basically defines a little bit of a, a sphere here. It looks a little squished, uh, I think, just because of the bounds of the data. So what we can do is uh, it's sort of, a, let's zoom in and give it a fixed range. I'm going to go minus 70 to 70 megaparsecs on each of the axes. Minus 70 to 70, squish. And in the z direction, minus 70 to 70. And that makes a nice spherical distribution of uh, stars here, or of galaxies here. And if you look at it at certain angles, you can see that a zone of exclusion where we can't see through the galaxy. Uh, so there is, that's the galactic plane blocking our view of galaxies. And then you can get a sense of there's some structure in there. Uh, to make that a little clearer, I'm going to shrink the size of the points uh, down a little bit, or their opacity. And you can sort of see the sort of wispy structure here. One of the features that you'll notice is it kind of looks like there are radial lines, like here's one and here's one and here's one, coming out of the center of the three-dimensional distribution. That is not a real feature. You'll have to remember that a lot of these systems are, have their distances measured using the Hubble flow, and that's a measurement of redshift. Part of that redshift is cosmological, but also part of it is from the motions of galaxies. And if you're in a cluster, you tend to have your motions kind of stirred up by the cluster. And so clusters get elongated here in this little distance space uh, measurement. Uh, so you can see some of those features. But there is this kind of three-dimensional structure to this with empty spaces and full spaces. And that is a manifestation of the three-dimensional structure of the universe. It has this filamentary pattern, kind of cobwebs of galaxies on the largest scales. So it's neat that we can actually see a little manifestation of that even here in the Z0 MGS. Now, the thing I promised you, I can close this one. I'll leave the uh, 2D plot open for now. Um, the thing that is most uh, useful right here is to make another 2D scatter plot and show you that star forming uh, galaxy sequence by changing the x axis to log SFR. It'll be down at the bottom of the list. Uh, oh, that goes on the y axis. We want log mass on the x-axis and log SFR on the y-axis. And this is exactly the plot that we wanted to take a look at. And you can sort of see this as a cloud of points. If you go over here to your plot control window and turn down the opacity, you can get a sense of the structure of those plots. And there's two kind of clouds here. This is the star forming main sequence, and then these are the slightly more massive quenched galaxies. These are in log units, so 10 is 10 to the 10 solar masses, and minus 1 up here is 0 0.1 solar masses per year. So you see uh, the full uh, pattern here of the star forming main sequence. Uh, the What we'll ask you to do on the um, homework assignment is to make a measurement of the star forming main sequence relationship. So what defines the star forming main sequence relationship? And we can do that uh, just by reading data off of this log log plot. Um, I'll kind of illustrate that for a bit. And all we're going to do here is kind of look up here and say, all right, uh, here's a point that is at about nine and minus one. And that's going to give me one point on the galaxy plot, 9 and minus 1. And they'll come up here and we'll go to, say, 10. And 10 will intersect it here at about 0.2, minus 0.2.
So from there, we can go and do a little calculation of what the relationship between these points are. So we had uh, one point, uh, we had an x equals 9, y equals minus 1. We'll give that subscript 1, and we'll do what, uh, that's not an x, that's an x, x2 and y2. We said that there was 10 and minus 0.2. And again, I'm just yanking those off of the points on the graph. So something sort of like here, and then something kind of up here. You can make a better approximation on this, especially if you say zoom in, uh, you can get good values of the data uh, to say, okay, nine and one would kind of fit with that. Uh, that's all makes sense. But uh, to return to what we're gonna do, we're gonna wanna calculate the line that describes the star forming uh, main sequence. And to do that, we're just going to rely on a little bit of algebra one uh, back in the day, and we're going to put this into point slope form, where I can calculate a slope as rise over run, y1 over x2 minus x1, and then I can put this into point slope form where I have a line that is y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. Now I'm not going to walk through this for the crappy data that I read off here, but it should give you a sense of how this works. But you do have to remember that y is equal to the log of the star formation rate. And then x is equal to the log of the stellar mass. And so from here, you can transform this relationship into a nice power law relationship and define what you have as the star forming main sequence. Uh, so that's one of the things you do. And then the other thing is we'll navigate this data set to read off some points and use this to make some predictions about the galaxy evolution. So we'll read off some points and make some comments about galaxy evolution. But before we get into that, that's sort of what you need for your homework, I want to illustrate something uh, just here about uh, it's present in the Z0 MGS data and show you a little bit of uh, uh, what I call subsetting tools, so the ability to measure things in a subset. And so what we'll need to do for that is to get these two plots up here, and I'm going to bring down one more plot, and I'm going to plot a one-dimensional histogram of the distances in the sample. So I create a histogram just like that, and then I go and I plot um, the dist underscore MPC in this one dimensional histogram. So that's uh, just what we see here. And uh, there aren't a lot of points out here, uh, but there are a few really far outlying galaxies that are present in the survey. Uh, so that's why it shows up here. I really want to limit this to somewhere between 0 and 70 megaparsecs, which is kind of where uh, most of the targets are. If we go, I guess, out to 75, we get a few more. But uh, I think that's what's important for us uh, now. Now, the thing is, that we want to look at is the Virgo cluster. And the Virgo cluster can be picked out on the sky as this blob of points basically right in the middle of your RA deck plot. It's at a right ascension of about 185 to 190 and a declination of about plus 12. People love the Virgo cluster because it turns out this is a really easy part of the sky to observe. Uh, so we can uh, see it reliably uh, and get uh, really good observations from the northern hemisphere. So I'm going to go up here. I'm going to select the circle uh, subset. And I'm going to kind of click on the middle of it. And I'm going to drag out a circle that's, oh, maybe about 10 degrees wide and get all those galaxies in there. And uh, that, you'll notice, as always, that highlights the different uh, subsets in my three plots. And you'll notice there is this little bump right here. Uh, if I go to that histogram and I turn the Y log on, you'll see that there is a little bump right here at about 18 megaparsecs. That's the Virgo cluster. So it's uh, relatively nearby so far as a galaxy cluster goes. Uh, it's sort of the biggest cluster of note in the environment. And uh, what I want to do is I want to select just for the Virgo cluster using this technique. So 
I've got a right ascension declination plot, but I only want galaxies between say about 10 and uh, maybe 25 parsecs. So this kind of region right here. So this is something that you may uh, probably haven't done yet, um, which is to go up here and in the active subset, I'm working on subset one, I want to change the mode, which is every time I draw something, it makes a new subset. I want to refine that and I'm going to click this button here. The little tooltip pops up and says that's an intersection. So I want to combine my right ascension and declination sample with a distance sample. So I say I want an intersection which fulfills all the points in this part of the sky. And I'm going to select kind of 10 to maybe 23 or so megaparsecs. That's about Virgo and uh, release that. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna combine that part of the sky and in those distances. And it just clips it off and it limits it to that subset. So everything's good. Um, and that is my selection of Virgo cluster galaxies. So I'll go up here and I'll say that this is Virgo. Done. The next thing I want to do is look at where the quenched systems that are in Virgo are found. And so what we'll do is we'll call these Virgo quenched. And what we want to do is start from the Virgo cluster selection. And uh, we can see the Virgo cluster selection. We'll uh, go over here, I'll shut off the full survey, and I'm going to zoom in here. And I see that there's this little structure to the Virgo cluster. It looks a little bit like uh, what we saw over here, um, where the point of those massive galaxies at the kind of middle top, uh, those are uh, these galaxies here. So we're finding a Virgo cluster. So we expect that a lot of our uh, quench systems should be uh, these targets. So what we'll do is we want to start from this sample and we want to create another one. So what I'm going to do is say I want a new subset and I want that to be called Virgo Quenched. And since I'm red, green, colorblind, this is going to be murder. I'm going to make that a nice, happy orange. No, wait, that's blue. Definitely blue. And there we go. So now I've got red and blue. Uh, thanks to years of playing video games, I can tell that those are the two sides you want to be on. Anyways, uh, so Virgo doesn't have anything in it. Virgo Quench doesn't have anything in it yet. So what we'll do is we'll go to Virgo, and this is kind of funny. We'll copy a subset out of it, and we'll go down to Virgo Quenched, and we will paste that subset. And you'll notice that makes everything into uh, Virgo quenched. So there's, uh, you can see that, I can shut it off. It's basically, it's the exact same selection. But for Virgo quenched, I further want to go here, use this intersection uh, tool up here, and select out the quench system. So that's this part. I'm gonna go and use that sort of little cloud selector. I'm gonna drag a little region around the quench systems and then I have to hit the enter button to say I'm done drawing and it thins it down to just the quench systems and so I can see those are the quench systems and I come back over here and can turn the Virgo cluster back on and sure enough those few targets right here those are the most massive clusters in the galaxy and in fact I can be sort of wild and see where those fall. Those are quite massive uh, systems is my prediction. So uh, yeah, let's, let's get wild. I want to go up here. I want to create a new subset and I'm going to see where those things end up. Mm -hmm. Where does that end up? Show me. Okay. Yeah. No, it's purple. So a mm, couple up there, more down here than I really wanted, but yeah, that is what it is. All right. So this illustrates some interesting principles. You'll notice with the quenched systems, they tend to be in the middle of dense regions in the cluster. And then the stuff that is the star forming main sequence is kind of found broadly here throughout. 
And so we can sort of see, okay, these are very uh, different populations and where they are located within a cluster actually determines a bit about whether they're quenched or not. So something about living in a galaxy cluster means that these systems are quenched and we should probably figure out what that was. So that brings me to the end of what I wanted to talk about on the data lecture, giving you a tour of the Z0 MGS data, set you up to do your homework, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap it up there, and I will see you later.